It's time for the three question warrant for Biochem 1. Let's get going. Which antibiotic fits each of the following descriptions? So first we have teeth discoloration, that's going to be tetracyclines. Tendinitis is going to be the fluoroquinolones. Red man syndrome is vancomycin. Gray baby syndrome is chloramphenicol. Cartilage damage in children, again, the fluoroquinolones. Side effects of nephrotoxicity, especially with cephalosporins, and ototoxic, uh, especially with loops, are going to be your aminoglycosides. Remember that the list of drugs that are both nephrotoxic and ototoxic are going to include the aminoglycosides, vancomycin, loop diuretics, and cisplatin. Side effect of pseudomembranous colitis uh, can be caused by really any antibiotic, technically, but the big ones that you'll get on test questions most of the time are going to be clindamycin and ampicillin. Drug of choice for gonorrhea is going to be ceftriaxone. Drug class of Lyme disease for Rocky Mountain spotted fever is going to be the tetracyclines. Used to treat uh, Giardia lamblia, that's going to be metronidazole. Can be used uh, to treat MRSA as well as C. diff colitis is going to be vancomycin. Next we have treatment for gram negative rods in patients with renal insufficiency, that's going to be as trianam. We have big gun effective against gram positive cocci, gram negative rods, and anaerobes, that could be meropenem or your combination of imipenem with psilostatin. Next, we have prophylaxis in AIDS patients against pneumocystis urovetsi pneumoniae. Uh, that's going to be uh, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. That's going to be the typical one. Alternatively, you can use dapsone uh, and then pentamidine as well. Next, we have used as solo prophylaxis against tuberculosis. That's going to be isoniazid. Long one there. All right, next question. Which antibiotics are safe during pregnancy? So all the penicillins and uh, amino penicillins, also piperacillin and cephalosporins. Macrolides, uh, specifically erythromycin and azithromycin, are safe. Metronidazole is safe after the first trimester. And then nitrofurantoin uh, can be used commonly for UTI treatments as well. Next question. What structures form Hesselbach's triangle? Uh, so the, uh, imagine that triangle kind of pointing down and towards the groin. Uh, the top of that triangle is the inferior epigastric artery. The medial border is the rectus abdominis muscle. And the lateral border is the inguinal ligament. That's it for the warm-up. Let's get to that lecture now. Hello. I'm here to take some of the mystery out of biochem mystery. When it comes to biochemistry, you probably fall into one of two camps. Most med students hate biochemistry, and I feel your pain. But there are people out there who genuinely love biochemistry. Maybe they majored in biochem. Maybe they have a PhD in biochem. I know, it seems sick, but it's not our place to judge. Now, we split the biochemistry videos into two groups. The first six videos deal with DNA and RNA and genetics, which is a little less intimidating for a lot of students. Then after we do psych and renal, we'll come back and do the rest of biochemistry with glucose metabolism and the TCA cycle and the electron transport chain and all the rest. But first, let's talk about DNA, which is fairly elementary, my dear Watson and Crick. DNA is really, really long, so in order to pack it all into the nucleus, it hangs out in a super condensed form called chromatin, which is basically DNA and some specialized proteins called histones. Eight specific histone proteins come together, and then the DNA strand wraps around them twice, and that unit is called a nucleosome. So the nucleosome consists of a core made of histones, and then the DNA is wrapped twice around that nucleosome core. And specifically, the core histones are histone 2A, histone 2B, histone 3, and histone 4. And you get two of each of those for a total of eight histones in the core. Now, those histone proteins consist of a lot of lysine and arginine, which makes the histones positively charged. And that positive charge makes it pretty easy for the histones to associate with DNA, which is negatively charged. Now, why is DNA negatively charged? Because of the negatively charged phosphate groups. And because the phosphate groups have this negative charge, the DNA is able to loop around the positively charged histones. So the DNA wraps twice around a core of eight histones, like a thread wrapping around a spool, and then you move down the DNA a little farther and you come to another nucleosome. So it's kind of like beads on a string where the nucleosomes are the beads. And then you have histone H1, which is the only histone that is not in the nucleosome core. And histone H1 is what ties one nucleosome to the next nucleosome. And that whole structure is chromatin, which helps pack a lot of DNA into a relatively small space. Now let's drill down a little deeper and look more closely at the structure of the DNA molecule itself. DNA is made up of two strands in a double helix, and the backbones are made up of deoxyribose linked together by phosphate groups. And then between the two backbones, like the rungs on a ladder, are the bases, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. In RNA, instead of thymine, you have uracil. Now sometimes we call these nucleobases, because when you take that base 
and you add the deoxyribose and a phosphate, then you have a nucleotide. Cytosine, thymine, and uracil are pyrimidines, and adenine and guanine are purines. Now, I'm sure you remember that A pairs with either T or U, and C pairs with G. But there are a few picky details that you may have forgotten that are worth remembering for step one. First, if you take cytosine and you remove this amino group, you get uracil. So deamination of cytosine makes uracil. And uracil is found in RNA while thymine is found in DNA. Another thing, the bond between the guanine and cytosine in complementary DNA strands has three hydrogen bonds, but the bond between adenine and thymine on the complementary DNA strands only has two hydrogen bonds. So as a result of this, the segments of DNA that have a higher content of C and G are going to have more bonds, and therefore they're going to have a higher melting temperature. So it's going to be more difficult to break those strands apart because of those additional hydrogen bonds. And that's definitely a testable point for step one. We're going to talk about the synthesis of purines and pyrimidines in just a second. But first, let's just briefly mention where the different ingredients come from. To make purines, again, there's adenine and guanine, you need the amino acids glycine, glutamine, and aspartate. You don't necessarily need to know where each specific carbon and nitrogen comes from. That was more for undergrad. But it is worth knowing that those three amino acids are used in the making of purines, glycine, glutamine, and aspartate, plus the vitamin tetrahydrofolate. Now, tetrahydrofolate is the metabolically active form of folic acid in your body. And this is one of the reasons why you need folic acid to be able to synthesize DNA. So the carbons and purines come from tetrahydrofolate, glycine, and also from CO2 or bicarbonate. So CO2, glycine, and tetrahydrofolate are the sources of carbon for purine synthesis. So that plus glutamine and aspartate, which contribute nitrogens, makes a total of five substances needed to make a purine. And again, you don't need to know which substances contribute which carbons, but I would know those five substances are required to make a purine. Then for pyrimidines, you use aspartate and something called carbamyl phosphate. Now carbamyl phosphate basically has one carbon and one nitrogen. The carbon comes from CO2, or bicarb again, and the nitrogen comes from glutamine. And then the phosphate part of carbamyl phosphate comes from ATP. That phosphate doesn't end up in the finished pyrimidine or the finished nucleotide, but the point is that the synthesis of pyrimidines requires ATP, it requires energy. So the four things needed to make pyrimidines are aspartate, glutamine, CO2, and ATP. And those last three together are used to make carbamyl phosphate. Next, let's talk about how we synthesize pyrimidines. Even though purines and pyrimidines are fairly similar, the way our bodies make them is totally different. Even the part of the purine ring that looks just like a pyrimidine is made in a completely different way, which is why the list of ingredients is different. Fundamentally, when you synthesize pyrimidines, you start with a base called erotic acid, and then you add a sugar to that base. And when we look at the purine synthesis in a moment, we're going to see that you start with a sugar, then you add the base. But let's start with focusing on pyrimidine synthesis. We said that pyrimidine synthesis starts with carbamyl phosphate. What did we say you needed to make carbamyl phosphate? Glutamine, CO2, and ATP. And there's an important enzyme that catalyzes this process, which is carbamyl phosphate synthetase 2, or CPS2. You should write that down, carbamyl phosphate synthetase 2. It's definitely an important enzyme to know about because it's the rate-limiting step of pyrimidine synthesis. Now, for biochemistry on step one, you need to focus on the rate-limiting enzymes of these various metabolic pathways. You don't have to memorize most metabolic pathways for step one, but you do need to know the rate limiters, as well as the enzymes that are deficient in various disease states, and I'll point those out as we go along. So CPS2 is the rate-limiting enzyme in pyrimidine synthesis. And you can probably guess that there's also a carbamyl phosphate synthetase 1. Now, don't get those two mixed up. Let's talk about the differences between CPS1 and CPS2. There are three distinct differences I want to highlight, and there's a table in your study guide that I want you to fill out. First is the location. CPS1 is found in the mitochondria. CPS2 is found in the cytosol. The second difference is that they're involved in different pathways. So CPS1 is involved in the urea cycle, which we'll talk about in a later video. But CPS2 is involved with pyrimidine synthesis. And then the third difference is the source of nitrogen. So CPS1 gets its nitrogen from ammonia. CPS2 gets its nitrogen from glutamine. After you generate carbamyl phosphate, there are several steps required to generate erotic acid. And you don't need to get bogged down in all those steps. We're just going to highlight a few important steps and a few key enzymes. Then from erotic acid, you generate UMP, which is uridine monophosphate. And this step requires PRPP, which is phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate. So PRPP provides the sugar and the phosphate for both pyrimidine nucleotides and purine nucleotides. 
So you started with a base, erotic acid, and then you add PRPP and you get UMP, that uridine monophosphate. And then you add a phosphate and you convert it to UDP. Then UDP can be used to form either CTP, which is cytosine triphosphate, or it can be used to form deoxy-UDP. There's an enzyme called ribonucleotide reductase that converts UDP to deoxy-UDP. And this is an enzyme worth knowing as being involved in the synthesis of pyrimidines. Now, if you remove a phosphate from deoxy-UDP, it becomes deoxy-UMP. And then another important enzyme comes along, which is thymidylate synthase. And that converts deoxy-UMP to deoxy-TMP. And thymidylate synthase uses tetrahydrofolate, which again is the metabolically active form of folic acid. So you need folic acid in order to synthesize nucleotides in DNA. Thymidylate synthase uses a carbon from tetrahydrofolate, and that leaves you with dihydrofolate. Then in order to regenerate tetrahydrofolate, you need the enzyme dihydrofolate reductase. So that's another step worth knowing. Now the reason these three enzymes are important to know is that there are some useful drugs that inhibit these enzymes. So let's look at these. Starting at the bottom, what drugs inhibit dihydrofolate reductase? Well, in prokaryotes, it's trimethoprim. You just covered that in micro. And in eukaryotes, it's methotrexate. And we mentioned methotrexate uh, as a DMAR used to treat rheumatoid arthritis back in the rheumatology section. And it's also used to treat some types of cancer and molar pregnancies. Uh, methotrexate is a folic acid analog that inhibits dihydrofolate reductase, which means you can't regenerate tetrahydrofolate, and that slows down the production of thymidine. So you can't make DNA. Now, moving up the pathway, another cancer drug that inhibits DNA synthesis by inhibiting pyrimidine synthesis is 5-fluorouracil, which inhibits the enzyme thymidylate synthase. So instead of being a folic acid analog, 5-FU is an analog of uracil that inhibits thymidylate synthase. We're going to talk more about 5-FU and methotrexate at the tail end of the course when we talk about cancer drugs. And then moving farther up the pathway, a drug that inhibits ribonucleotide reductase is hydroxyurea. Hydroxyurea is used in the treatment of sickle cell disease, and it's also sometimes used to treat cancer. I also want to talk briefly about a condition called erotic aciduria, which is where you have a defect in this pyrimidine synthesis pathway and too much erotic acid in the urine. Now, it's not erotic acid, like 50 shades of DNA. It's erotic acid. So erotic acid results from a genetic disorder, an autosomal recessive disorder, where you have a deficiency of an enzyme called UMP synthase. Now, when that enzyme doesn't work, you can't convert erotic acid to UMP, which means that erotic acid is going to build up in the body and then it spills into the urine. So the clinical findings are, first of all, elevated erotic acid in the urine. Uh, another distinguishing feature is that there's no hyperaminemia. That's important because another cause of elevated erotic acid in the urine is a condition called ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency, or OTC deficiency, and that's a, a disruption in the urea cycle. We're going to talk about that a little bit more when we get to the urea cycle in Biochem 15. So patients with OTC deficiency have high erotic acid levels and also high ammonia levels because they're disrupting the urea cycle. So if you see erotic acid in the urine, the next question should be, is the ammonia level elevated or not? So high erotic acid plus high ammonia is OTC deficiency. High erotic acid plus normal ammonia is erotic aciduria due to the deficiency of UMP synthase. Erotic aciduria also causes failure to thrive, so these babies don't gain weight very well. And then finally, these patients have megaloblastic anemia. Remember, they can't make UMP, they can't make pyrimidines, and that's a problem for rapidly dividing cells that require new DNA, such as the hemo hematopoietic cells. So these patients are going to get megaloblastic anemia. This is actually an unusual cause of megaloblastic anemia. Most of the time when you see megaloblastic anemia, it's because of B12 or folate deficiency, and that blocks the tetrahydrofolate part of the pyrimidine pathway. But with erotic aciduria, the problem is not B12 or folate. So this is megaloblastic anemia that is not responsive to B12 or folic acid supplementation. Then how do we treat erotic aciduria? Well, you just bypass the pathway by supplementing uridine in the diet. This is a common theme in the treatment of these biochemical disorders. If you're missing an enzyme in the pathway that takes you from point A to point F, and you're not able to get to point F because you've got a deficiency at point B, well, you just bypass point B. You supplement a molecule that gets plugged in at point C so you can eventually get on downstream to point F. So you just bypass the deficiency in those biochemical disorders. You're going to supplement uridine into the diet, and that way you can enter the pathway at UMP, and that can going to continue on and form the pyrimidines. Let's talk about purine synthesis next. Now, I mentioned earlier that when you synthesize pyrimidines, you start with erotic acid as a base, and then you add the sugar. But again, with purine synthesis, we're going to start with the sugar and then add the base. 
Compared to pyrimidine synthesis, de novo purine synthesis is much less complicated. Purine synthesis starts by converting ribose 5-phosphate to PRPP. Then the rate-limiting step of purine synthesis is catalyzed by an enzyme called glutamine PRPP amidotransferase. And there's another cancer drug called 6-mercaptopurine that inhibits PRPP amidotransferase. So 6-MP, or 6-mercaptopurine, inhibits purine synthesis by inhibiting PRPP amidotransferase. We're going to talk about 6-MP with the cancer drugs as well. Then there are several steps that require glycine and aspartate, glutamine, and tetrahydrofolate. So again, tetrahydrofolate is critical for both purine and pyrimidine synthesis. But ultimately, you're going to form IMP, which is inosine monophosphate. And that goes on to form either AMP or GMP. Now, the enzyme that converts IMP to GMP is called inosine monophosphate dehydrogenase, which I mentioned because the immunosuppressant drug mycophenolate inhibits that enzyme. Maybe you remember that from immunology. So that's how you make purines and pyrimidines. But with purines, you don't always have to make them from scratch. You can also recycle and salvage them. So let's take a look at the purine salvage pathway for a minute and talk about some diseases caused by deficiencies in that pathway. First of all, when you break down nucleosides like GTP, you start by stripping off the phosphate groups one at a time, releasing energy as you go from GTP to GDP to GMP down to plain old guanosine. And then if you strip the ribose sugar off of guanosine, you're left with the nucleobase guanine. And the ultimate end product of purine breakdown is uric acid. So let's start down there at the bottom and work our way backwards up the pathway. The precursor of uric acid is xanthine. And the enzyme that catalyzes this conversion of xanthine to uric acid is xanthine oxidase. And we've come across this enzyme xanthine oxidase a couple of times already. In rheumatology, we use the drugs allopurinol and also febuxostat to inhibit xanthine oxidase to block the production of uric acid in gout patients. So allopurinol inhibits xanthine oxidase. And we also mentioned an immunosuppressant that was metabolized by xanthine oxidase, which means that patients on allopurinol will be at risk of increased toxicity. Do you remember what that drug was? It was azathioprine, and also its anti-cancer cousin, 6-mercaptopurine. So 6-mercaptopurine and azathioprine are both metabolized by xanthine oxidase. And the toxicity of these drugs is going to be increased when you administer allopurinol, because again, that's inhibiting which enzyme? Xanthine oxidase. So again, working our way backwards, where does xanthine come from? Well, it comes from either guanine or hypoxanthine. And we already talked about how you break down GMP to guanosine to guanine. But here's where we have the opportunity to do some recycling. There's an enzyme that can recycle guanine back to GMP, and that enzyme is hypoxanthine guanine phosphoribosyl transferase, or HGPRT. It's a phosphoribosyl transferase. It transfers a phosphate group and a ribosyl sugar group onto guanine to make GMP. And then in the middle, you can break down IMP to inosine to hypoxanthine. But that same enzyme, HGPRT, or hypoxanthine guanine phosphoribosyl transferase, can transfer a phosphate and a sugar onto hypoxanthine to make IMP. Now, if you're deficient in this HGPRT enzyme, it causes a disease called Lesch-Nyhan syndrome. With Lesch-Nyhan, you can't recycle or salvage those purines, so you end up pushing everything downstream and you're overproducing uric acid. And if you have a ton of uric acid around, what disease will that cause? Well, typically it's going to cause gout. So one of the findings of Lesch-Nyhan syndrome is that you have gout. You also have some CNS problems like intellectual disability, aggressive behavior, and self-mutilation, which is classically lip biting. You can also see chorioathetosis, or these writhing choreoform involuntary movements. So how do we treat Lesch-Nyhan syndrome? Well, you're generating an excess of uric acid. So how can you avoid generating an excess of uric acid? By giving allopurinol. It's going to treat the hyperuricemia, it's going to treat the gout, but unfortunately there's no drug to treat the neurologic features. Another disease to briefly mention is adenosine deaminase deficiency. Now, going back to the purine salvage pathway one more time, AMP is broken down to adenosine, and then the enzyme adenosine deaminase converts adenosine to inosine. Now, where have we seen adenosine deaminase before? I'll give you a hint. It was in immunology. Adenosine deaminase deficiency is one of the causes of SCID, or severe combined immunodeficiency. Now, there are a bunch of gene defects that cause SCID, but adenosine deaminase deficiency is the only one you need to focus on for step one. But as a quick review, does SCID uh, affect the B cells or the T cells? It actually affects both. It's a combined immunodeficiency. And what was the clinical triad in SCID? Severe recurrent infections like candidiasis or pneumocystis pneumonia, chronic diarrhea, 
and failure to thrive. And then finally, we also said there would be no thymic shadow on the newborn chest x-ray. All right, that brings us to our end of session quiz. So go ahead and complete that, and then we'll go over the answers. First question, what's the rate-limiting enzyme in purine synthesis? We said that's glutamine PRPP amidotransferase. And what about pyrimidine synthesis? That's CPS2. Next, what are the sources of carbons in the formation of purines? So it's CO2 and glycine and tetrahydrofolate are the carbon sources. And we also said you need aspartate and glutamine, but they provide nitrogen, not carbon. And then what are the carbon sources in pyrimidine synthesis? Well, the carbons come from aspartate and CO2. And then glutamine is also necessary to provide a nitrogen in carbamyl phosphate. Next, which medication matches each of the following statements? So inhibits ribonucleotide reductase, that's hydroxyurea. Inhibits dihydrofolate reductase, is both trimethoprim and also methotrexate. Inhibits thymidylate synthase, that's 5-fluorouracil. Inhibits IMP dehydrogenase, that's mycophenolate. And inhibits PRPP amidotransferase, that's 6-mercaptopurine. Next, what are the characteristic features of erotic aciduria? So the key features are erotic acid in the urine, obviously, no elevation in ammonia, failure to thrive, and megaloblastic anemia, which you cannot correct by giving B12 or folic acid supplements. Next, what accounts for the positive charge of histones? That's lysine and arginine. And then what accounts for the negative charge of DNA? The phosphate groups. And the last one, how many adenine residues are found in the molecule of DNA if one strand con it contains a, 2,000, G, 500, C, 1,500, and T, 1,000. Well, this seems super easy, but there's a tiny twist to it. One strand of DNA has 2,000 adenine residues, but you have to remember that a DNA molecule is a double helix. There are two strands, and since adenine pairs to thymine, one strand is going to have 2,000 adenines and 1,000 thymines, but the complementary strand is going to have another 1,000 adenines that are paired to the thymines, so that gives you a total of 3,000 adenine residues. All right. That's it for the end of session quiz. Well, let's go over a few of these rapid fire facts. First one says a boy with self mutilating behavior, intellectual disability, and gout. Think about Lesh Nyhan syndrome. Erotic acid in the urine plus elevations in serum ammonia. That's going to be a urea cycle disorder, like ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency. Erotic acid in the urine and no elevations in the serum ammonia. That's going to be erotic acid urea. And then megaloblastic anemia that does not improve with folate and B12. That's erotic acid urea again. All right. That's it for Biochem 1. I'll see you next time.